Hi everyone, welcome to another webinar on forensic psychology. Today we're going to be focusing on the cognitive explanations of offending behaviour. And this falls under paper 3 in the AQA Psychology A-Level. We have a number of lesson goals today. The first is to develop an overall understanding of the cognitive explanations for offending behaviour. And there are two main ones that you need to know. You need to know cognitive distortions and also you need to know Kohlberg's theory of moral reasoning. We're going to be able to outline and evaluate and also use research into moral development to evaluate the cognitive explanations of offending behaviour. And we will also make links to topics covered in issues and debates. And of course, we can suggest additional AO3 points using our knowledge of psychology and the economy and approaches as a whole. Cognitive explanations in psychology suggest that our behaviours are determined by the way that we think. So the cognitive explanation looks at how thinking and moral reasoning affects our behaviour. In forensic psychology, it looks at how thinking and moral reasoning can determine criminal behaviour. Cognitive distortion is just a form of irrational thinking and distortions themselves are ways that reality has become twisted. So what is perceived no longer represents what is actually true. There are four cognitive distortions that you can refer to as part of your AO1 description for the cognitive explanations of offending behaviour. On this slide, we're just going to go through what each four um, of those cognitive distortions mean. And on the following slide, we're going to try and apply them to use and explain criminal behaviour. The first cognitive distortion is hostile attribution bias. And this is when an individual has a tendency to assume the worst. Um, so they have negative interpretations of one's behaviour and that in turn may lead them to respond in an, an aggressive way. We have minimisation and this is when you downplay or you under exaggerate the consequences of your behaviour. So you minimise those consequences and that can be a distortion because you might be stealing someone's um, precious jewellery that they got from their grandmother but you downplay it because perhaps they come from a rich background and you say well they can get another one. Egocentric bias, emphasis on your own needs than the needs of other people. And finally, causal attributions, not casual, causal attributions, blaming other people for your behaviour, not taking responsibility and having an external locus of control. So how can these cognitive distortions explain offending behaviour? Well, we'll start off with the first one again, hostile attribution bias. It could explain violent crimes and violent crimes may be as a result of an individual assuming that perhaps a group of people are speaking about them or are planning to attack them in some sort of way. And they then react violently towards that group and hence they commit a crime. With minimisation, I used the example in the previous slide in terms of theft, so stealing from a wealthy family as you minimise the consequences because you believe they can easily replace what you have stolen. Egocentric bias, so this can often explain sexual offences whereby the individual seeks to please themselves, so they're, they're egocentric and they don't consider the feelings, the needs or the, the consent of the victim. And finally, for causal attribution, mass killings, genocide, this can definitely explain those instances whereby people are acting under the command of someone else. So it's a causal attribution because they don't see themselves as responsible for the crime that they're committing. They attribute it to something external. So they have an external locus of control. So we've got one exam question, two marks. It says, outline one cognitive distortion shown by offenders who attempt to justify their crime. And just using the previous slide, you are able to answer this question. You can pick any cognitive distortion and you'll be credited if you are able to outline that cognitive distortion and provide a small example. Here's an example answer for that previous exam question. So it says one cognitive distortion displayed by offenders who attempt to justify their crime is minimization. This is when individuals minimize the consequences of their deviant actions as less significant or less damaging than they are. You might want to use a different word other than minimize. So you can use the word downplay or under exaggerate. All of those are equally fine. 
So we've covered our AO1 for the cognitive distortions, and it's really that simple. Very, very simple, just four cognitive distortions. We explained it, and we were able to provide examples for each cognitive distortion. Now to provide some AO3 points, and we're going to use our standard point evidence explain and however um, format for this. So there's research support for hostile attribution bias as a cognitive distortion. Our point is there is research support for the hostile attribution bias. And our evidence is Schoenberg and Ice conducted a study in 2014, so it's quite a recent study, when 55 prisoners were compared to a matched control group of non-prisoners. The prisoners showed greater hostile attribution bias when presented with faces of varying emotion, as they assumed that any picture with some expression of anger was an expression of aggression. Our conclusion, match pair design, really good it reduces the effect of participant variables so we can credit the the process or the method used in that particular study 2014 high temporal validity for that study however 55 is a small sample size so beyond that what will you add after that well you can start off by saying this matters because the research provides support for the fact that hostile attribution bias may explain why those prisoners were in prison um, in comparison to the match control group. It could be that they have a predisposition of irrational thinking towards hostile attribution bias. We got research support for minimization as well. So our point is there is research support for minimization as a cognitive distortion. The evidence comes from Grubbin who found that offenders accounts of their crime often downplayed their behavior and placed the blame on the victim. However, minimization is not restricted to criminals. It is something that everyone does, along with causal attribution bias. It is considered normal to blame events on external sources as a way of protecting ourselves. Now, I'll be the first one to raise my hand and said, if I can get the blame away from me in any way, I will try. And I think many people can, can share the same um, testimony in that nobody wants to be caught out. Everybody, when, when they do something wrong, they like to minimize it or downplay it. If you break a plate in your mum's house, especially if, if it's a Nigerian mum's house, you will downplay it. Mum, it's only a plate. You know, if someone does something, you know, horrible to you, you might downplay it and say, oh, it was only a little joke. We all minimize things. We all think irrationally. So there's a suggestion here that prisoners are no different to the normal population. And actually trying to, to label cognitive distortions as this thing that is deviant and abnormal is quite wrong. Our last AO3 point before we move on to Kohlberg's levels of moral reasoning in explaining offending behaviour is that cognitive explanations of offending can lead to cognitive treatments. If we understand that people are thinking irrationally and these irrational thoughts are leading to criminal behaviour, then we as psychologists can do well to try and tackle the irrational thinking with treatment. The evidence, well, we know that in later on, you guys will be looking at anger management if you haven't done so already as a way of dealing with offending behavior. Also cognitive disputing. So from psychopathology, I know we use disputing when we're treating depression, but this is rightly applicable to the treatment of offenders who think irrationally. So you might want to use the DEF part of Albert Ellis's um, ABC model. Um, and D is for disputing. And there are three ways in which that we dispute. We ask ourselves, is it logical to think this way? Is there any evidence for me to think this way? And is it practical for me to think this way? All of these could be ways in which that we tackle irrational thinking before it leads on to criminal behavior. This matters because it might mean that we are able to reduce recidivism, so reduce reoffending. It deals with the cause of crime and doesn't just simply punish the offender for, for getting caught. And also there's real links between psychology and the economy because if we are able to prevent crimes from taking place by offering this treatment to those who are perhaps um, displaying irrational thoughts, irrational thinking, then it means that we spend less money housing individuals in prison and we spend less money contributing towards the fact that so many people reoffend. However, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy is not applicable for all types of criminals. You know, there, there's a difference between thinking irrational and there's a difference between, you know, just being pure, heartless and depraved in one's actions. Um, and also CBT is not efficient because it does cost time, money and finances. It costs training, sorry, and finances. So there are a lot of drawbacks in as much as it's a lovely idea, we have to weigh up the cost um, against the benefits. 
So the second explanation under the cognitive explanations for offending behavior is Kohlberg's levels of moral reasoning. And what Kohlberg did is he interviewed boys and men about the reasons for their moral decisions and he then constructed this stage theory. And in terms of how he approached his research and in terms of the questions that he asked them in the interview, he would just simply ask them to describe whether um, a particular act or a particular behavior was appropriate or right in various situations, various scenarios that he would provide for them. And he would just record their response. So he came up with this six stage model that's broken down into three levels. So we've got level one, pre-conventional morality, level two, conventional morality, and level three, post-conventional morality. And you can see the stages that they are broken into. So just looking at level one, pre-conventional morality, that word conventional simply means the norm. So this is prior to anyone understanding what is normal behavior, what is appropriate behavior in society. And therefore, individuals who are at this stage of moral reasoning really regard their morals on the basis of whether I'm being punished for it or not. So the behaviours are driven by avoiding punishment and seeking rewards. If you have a look at level two conventional morality is when we now become aware of what the moral standards in society are. What are the norms held in society? How can I ensure that I'm behaving in such a way that allows me to maintain my interpersonal relationships? How can I behave in such a way that allows me to gain and maintain the social approval that I have among my friends, my family and so on? So their behaviours or their moral decisions, their moral judgments are based on social norms and it's based on conforming to what the standard is, is set in society. And then finally for level three, we've got post-conventional morality and we can see here that this is beyond, you know, having moral judgment based on what is socially acceptable and socially normal. Actually, this individual, anyone who's at this level of moral reasoning, thinks beyond the norms and actually values human life, sees individuals as being important, important, sees individuals as valuable. And we can see examples of this whereby people are very self-sacrificial. They are at the post-conventional level of morality. Now it's good that you know these six stages and if you can't remember all six stages at least remember the levels and be able to describe them and see what I did there at the start I was able to break down what that word conventional means and that will enable you to you know unpack what pre-conventional, conventional and post-conventional mean in relation to um, our moral development. In terms of how we link Kohlberg's levels of moral reasoning to explain offending behavior. Well, there's this explanation that criminals are likely to be at the pre-conventional level set by Kohlberg. And remember, individuals at the pre-conventional level, their morals are based on rewards and punishment. And we can say that perhaps individuals who are operating at this level believe that breaking the law is justified if the reward outweighs the punishment. So if I'm going to get that momentary pleasure that I, I crave in that moment, it justifies the punishment that could be a result of my, my actions. Individuals who commit crimes at the conventional level tend to feel that their behavior was justified because it helped to maintain relationships or society. So for example, that might be a, a young person who's among a group of friends and everyone is dealing with hard drugs. I can't even list out any particular hard drugs. I might, yeah. But they're dealing hard drugs and it's illegal. But in order to maintain their friendships, they believe that it's acceptable and justified to engage in that particular behavior. So Colbert proposed that crimes may be committed by individuals who have lower levels of moral reasoning. And this was based on his theory of moral development. So the higher the stage, the more sophisticated the reasoning. Criminals do not progress from the pre-conventional level of moral reasoning. They simply seek to avoid punishment and gain rewards. They have a childlike reasoning. Therefore, adults and adolescents who reason at this level may commit crimes if they can get away with it or gain rewards in the form of money or increased respect. Whereas non-criminals tend to reason at high levels and sympathize with the rights of others, exhibiting honesty, generosity and non-violence. So these are people who are at the post-conventional level of moral reasoning. So that's a summary of Kohlberg's levels of moral reasoning. Now, essentially, 
individuals who are at the pre-conventional level of moral reasoning are unable to tell the difference between right and wrong unless they are punished or they receive a reward. And this has real world application because we have the age of criminal responsibility in the UK, whereby children who are under the age of 10 cannot be charged with a crime because it's believed that they don't understand the idea of moral responsibility. In other words, they are at that pre-conventional level. And it does make sense because perhaps children well and truly do not tell the difference or can't tell the difference between right and wrong however there is some caveats there are some caveats we know that there are some children they truly do know the difference between right and wrong they do know what is accepted in society and this is where we have a catch-22 between whether we punish you know children under 10 who we believe are not at the pre-conventional level but they are in fact at the conventional or whether we let them go on the basis that they are at the pre-conventional level, according to Kohlberg. We have support and research for Kohlberg's levels of moral reasoning, and this research comes from Palmer and Holland, who compared moral reasoning between 210 female non-offenders, 122 male non-offenders, and 126 convicted offenders using a moral dilemma questionnaire. And what they found is that 126 convicted offenders showed less mature moral reasoning, in other words, they were at the pre-conventional level, than the non-delinquent group which is consistent with Kohlberg's predictions. So the non-offenders tend to have shown a higher level of moral reasoning, so they would have been at the conventional or the post-conventional level, whereas the offenders in this study were identified as being in the pre-conventional level. In relation to this, Blackburn 1993 suggests that delinquents show poor moral development because of a lack of role-playing opportunities during childhood, which help develop moral reasoning skills. So the argument there is that actually our development of moral reasoning has to start off at that pre-conventional stage, whereby we learn through role models in our environment what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. Therefore, if a child hasn't got a suitable role model in their environment, or if they have a deviant role model in their environment, they are likely to remain at that pre-conventional level. Now, if you have the textbook on the screen, this one right here, I would encourage you to open up to page 269 and read it, annotate the research on that page with regards to Kohlberg's theory. I'm going to quickly read through some of the points and I'll make some notes um, as we go along. Now, one of the points is that there is strong gender bias within the research conducted in this area. And the gender bias is a beta bias because most of the research has been conducted on men. And what happens is they try and use the research conducted on men to try and explain female behavior. This is problematic because we know that men and women are different, even when it comes to moral judgment. So can we actually use the findings from a research that was completely done on men to explain female behavior? If we do so, then we are minimizing the differences between the sexes and is an example of beta bias. So this goes from, you know, as you read, you'll find that there are a number of pieces of research that were only done on men, surveys only given to men, and so on and so forth. You are able to apply this evaluation point to that. Moreover, a lot of the research is highly dependent on um, self-report and interviews. Um, and this is an issue because we know that it, within self-report techniques, there is a, a tendency to lie. There's a tendency to try and present oneself in a positive light. So that's social desirability bias. There's also demand characteristics. So perhaps an individual is conforming to the demands of the study. There's also the screw you effect, whereby, you know, if a prisoner knows what, tries to guess what the study is about, they may behave in a way or respond in a way that is detrimental to the study. So all of these issues are present with self-report and interviews. On the bright side, using a self-report and interviewing technique can be useful in terms of being cost and time efficient. And also perhaps that allows for some quantitative analysis as well. I've also put here the nomothetic versus the ideographic approach and the cognitive explanations is highly nomothetic in that it, it overgeneralizes every person as having this capacity to perhaps think irrationally and that being the explanation for offending behavior. However, we may need to be ideographic in our approach because we know when it comes to criminal behavior, 
individuals vary criminals vary from from criminal to criminal one may have committed a crime indeed because they they had a degree of um, irrational thinking while another may have committed a crime because they were deeply in need um and they saw no way no other way to survive other than to steal bread from tesco's or whatever so this calls for a more holistic approach in terms of how we explain offending behavior we cannot just say that offending behavior is as a result of irrational thinking there are multiple contributing factors and there was a study done by david farrington he conducted a longitudinal study um, in south london actually on roughly 400 boys and what he found is that there were factors such as poverty and um, factors such as your your family background genetics education which all contributed to those um, 400 boys going into a life of crime so it's important that in terms of our levels of explanation yes we're, we're currently at the psychological level of explanation when we're looking at the reductionism versus holism debate but perhaps we need to move a little bit higher into the social and cultural explanations to look at how those may contribute and explain criminal behavior I'd like to quickly home in on one of the studies on that page which you would have read and the study was a questionnaire which was given out to 128 male juvenile offenders and what that questionnaire found is that 38 percent did not consider the consequences of what they were doing so they did not consider the consequences of their criminal behavior furthermore 36 percent thought that they would not be caught now we have to ask ourselves okay we've got these these figures why does it matter why is it important how might it explain cognitive um, distortions how might it explain moral reasoning in the context of offending behavior so i'll give you a moment to have a go at writing your own this matters because and i'm also going to follow up by showing you my own paragraph for this study so this matters because the fact that 38 percent of the 128 male offenders did not consider the consequences of their behavior reveals that cognitive distortions such as minimization were involved as they have minimized downplayed the consequences of their criminal behavior furthermore 36 percent thought that they would not be caught and this is important because it provides support for the influence of moral reasoning on offending behavior this result indicates that these young offenders were at the first stage pre-conventional of the levels of moral reasoning individuals who reason at this level may commit crimes if they can get away with it or gain rewards in the form of money or increased respect so we've got a wholesome um, this matters because paragraph and then we have however if we expand the percentage what is the counter argument and this is something that i encourage you to do you will get a percentage in all areas of psychology for various pieces of research and simply unpacking the percentage can give you an additional AO3 point or an additional however point so if we were to unpack the percentage well 38 percent of the 128 mom offenders did not consider the consequences of their behavior well that means the remaining percentage did consider the consequences of their behavior and they still went on to offend so that in itself suggests that irrational thinking and it suggests that moral reasoning is not the sole determinant in offender behavior so while this research provides support it also provides some counter arguments in terms of the cognitive explanation not being the total explanation for offending behavior so we've come to the end of the webinar on the cognitive explanations for offending behavior i do hope that you enjoyed it i hope that it's been useful and i just want to leave you with this proverb from the bible it says as a man thinks in his heart so is he and this is just to encourage you that as you approach the exam season your thoughts should be excellent your thoughts should be positive your thoughts should be wholesome your thoughts should be great towards yourself and towards your academic success i'm praying for you guys and i'm so encouraged by your response to the video so far um, please make sure you like comment subscribe share it with your friends who are studying psychology and also follow me on twitter psychology with miss k the best teacher in the world god bless you guys